on in the DMT work, you know, was, you know, I did speculate, although it isn't an established, you know, fact yet, you know, but I did speculate, you know, that DMT as, a, you know, could increase with the stress of dying, um, and that if, you know, DMT is released or, you know, if it's established, you know, you know to be released um, at the time of death, yeah, you know, then giving DMT could help people kind of, you know, prepare for death. It could be like a dry run for death, and, you know, they can start negotiating, you know, some of those issues, um, you know, when they're still alive. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, they are doing studies now with end-of-life, you know, therapy with, you know, psilocybin, and, you know, um, some of those reports are quite positive. And when these compounds were being studied in, you know, the 1960s, you know, there were some in encouraging, you know, results that were, you know, coming out, you know, from LSD studies at, you know, end-of-life end um kind of work, you know, DPT is a drug like DMT, and, you know, that was also being given, you know, to dying patients and, you know, seemed to be quite helpful. Um, what was your role in helping volunteers with their experiences? Did you guide them or um, what What was, what was part did you play in that and what kind of preparatory work was done on the volunteers before they had their experiences? Yeah, um, like everybody went through a uh, you know, relatively standardized protocol. In terms of how people, uh, you know, found out about the study, um, it was through word of mouth primarily. Um, so people would either call me or call the research nurse to kind of get, you know, some background information. If they were still interested, I would spend some time on the telephone flushing out in, you know, some more detail, uh, you know, what their interest in the work was and what their experience, you know, with these drugs were. Um, I was really only interested in studying people with, you know, previous experience using psychedelics. Um, and if, you know, they were still interested, um, I would send them a number of articles and paperwork and a description of the uh, study that I was recruiting for at uh, the time. Once they read over, you know, that packet of information, if they were still interested, you know, they would come in. Uh, you know, for an interview. And, uh, you know, we would spend at least an hour sometimes, too, talking about them and their interest in the field and their, you know, previous experience, you know, with psychedelics. Uh, I was really only interested in, you know, people that could handle their drugs, you know, so to speak, because um, it was going to be an extremely demanding study. You know, they're going to have all kinds of tubes and, you know, wires attached to them. Uh, it was going to be an intense experience on DMT. It was going to be taking place in a hospital. I was quite, you know, keen on exploring their adverse responses, you know, to these drugs in the past and, you know, how they managed them, those kinds of things. So you wanted ex experienced psychonauts that c could have a reference point to their experiences. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, sure. yeah. Well, I, I was interested in, you know, them, you know, being able to describe their experiences, you know, verbally in an articulate, you know, sophisticated manner. Um, and also, you know, um, I wanted, you know, them to be able, you know, to know what to expect as well, you know, that they wouldn't panic. Um, yeah, you know, so after that, you know, they went through like a physical exam and some blood tests and a cardiogram. And uh, um, I did, you know, the physical exam in, you know, the outpatient suite of, of uh, the research unit. Yeah, you know, so if, uh, you know, they got uh, through all of those stages of things, you know, then they would come in you know, for a small dose of the drug to just, you know, familiarize themselves, you know, to the research environment. Um, I coached, you know, the volunteers only to the bare minimum required. Um, I told them it was going to start quickly. It was going to be over fast. With the higher doses, they were going to uh, experience some anxiety um, early on as, you know, the effects, you know, kicked in because they were going to be so strong and, you know, so sudden. You know, it was interesting, you know, the informed consent, you know, document that I had everybody sign. It's um, actually kind of comical um, in retrospect. You know, you have to describe what kind of responses are to occur after, you know, giving uh, um, a drug in an experimental study. You know, um, so I was quite clear in, you know, telling people, you know, that they may think that they've died. <laughs> and, you know, they may think that they've gone insane, you know, those kinds of things. Um you know, in a small, you know, percentage um, of cases anyway. You know, but other than, you know, kind of the worst case, you know, scenario <laughs> and, you know, uh, um, and, you know, the speed of onset and, you know, the time course, 
um, I, you know, just told, you know, people, uh, you know, to let go. You know, that was, you know, the most important aspect of a, you know, successful, uh, you know, big experience with DMT is if if you resisted it or if you fought it, you know, then it was going to, you know, probably, you know, turn bad. And, Be a bad trip. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, exactly, because, you know, uh, it it's extremely hard, you know, to resist, you know, the onslaught of DMT effects. Um, mm-hmm. You know, was, uh, so the best approach is, you know, is, you know, to let go, you know, to, uh, you know, to drop the resistance and, you know, to just, and, you know, to just, uh, you know, kind of open to the experience no matter what it is. Except you know, whatever, so. whatever happens. <laughs> well, yeah, but, you know, because if, if you do open, you know, to the experience, you know, then you can kind of go on to the next level of it. And if if you resist it, you're, you know, kind of stuck, you know, kind of battling it and you don't, you know, make any progress. That was another question I wanted to ask you. Some people have reported like demonic entities and other frightening experiences. Uh, do you feel that this is a result of improper dosage, a less than relaxed environment, or could it be something more spiritual like the, like the karma that the person's carrying? Well, yeah, I think it can be a combination of all those and, you know, then some. Um, if you start off as a frightened, paranoid person and you take a mind-blowing drug like DMT, uh, you know, your natural response to any kind of confusing or perplexing, you know, situation could be to interpret it in a paranoid, you know, uh, you know kind of way. Um, also, you know, if you're even an open-minded, cool, relaxed person, uh, you know, but you get scared um, when the drug effects begin, you can start resisting and... Uh, you know, and you know, so resistance and you know, fear can be kind of you know symbolized in the mind um, as you know demonic you know kinds of forces. Um, and you know, there are spiritual. Well, yeah, I'm convinced there are spiritual you know levels of you know reality out there, and you know that you can make you know contact with them, you know, through drugs like DMT or through meditation practices or you know through prayer or um, any you know number of spiritual technologies out there. You know, so you have to be, you know, kind of careful what you ask for, too. You know, if you want to open yourself up to spiritual, you know, forces, you, um, you got to be prepared, for, you know, for both the good and the bad. That's exactly right. I mean, uh, a lot of people say that DMT shows you the duality of the universe and how there's good, there's bad, there's evil, there's, you know, there's good and evil. There's, you know, light and dark. And what you see is is, is just you know what really is and he, whether that's yourself or you know the universe all working together or well, you're going to see reality <laughs> is is what so- someone once told me yeah well I, I would you know say that's true either i'm um, either your own reality i guess depending on your perspective or you know the reality of the universe at, at a larger scale <clears throat> um let's see Oh, um, back to Terrence McKenna. Are you familiar with the time wave theory? And if so, can you maybe describe a little bit for the listeners what that's about? Oh, gosh. I have no authority <laughs> on uh, the time wave theory. Uh, you know, it's this weird stoned idea that Dennis and Terrence came up with. Uh, do you think, I mean, do, I, I have a hard time believing uh, believing in the time wave theory just because, you know, you can look at the I Ching and, and uh, try to make stuff up as you go along all you want but you know the the reality is that we we make the world we live in and we can make it good or we can make it bad you know and nothing's set in stone and the time wave theory kind of argues with that yeah well you, uh, you know it, it's you know kind of like astrology in a way although obviously it hasn't been uh, like around um, as long as astrology has but uh it um it defines a specific you know set of constraints uh you know like astrology does um and you know like your dna does as well and you know like your environment does as well you know so there are res- you know constraints out there but um i also you know believe you know that within you know sets of constraints we still have got you know uh the uh freedom to act within those constraints we still have that free will yeah, there still is, you know, free will, you know, but it is, you know, confined, you know, in a certain way, you know, by our own biology and, 
you know, perhaps external influences, you know, like the stars and, you know, the time wave theory of novelty and those kinds of things. Do you think that these entities that people are encountering are there to teach us something? Do you think they have a distinct